These fellows here are the amazing honey ant. You can only get them around this desert country in central Australia. They work by hiding underneath the ground, and these fellows here are the storage factories. These other little blokes on my finger here, they're the workers. They've got to get up on the ground surface, climb up the trees, collect the pollen and the nectar, and then back underground to feed their mates. During the hard times in the desert, these workers come down underground and feed off these larder factories. It's a great system. They're not bad stuff either. Proper sweet one, yeah. For the women of Papanya, the honey ant has special significance. It's a central part of their dreaming, their tradition. And these honey ants tell us a couple of symbolic things about living out here in the desert country. Firstly, they're an excellent example of survival. Like the traditional desert people themselves, they're very well adapted to survive the countless droughts. They also tell us that out here in the desert, you can get good tucker. <laughs> Papunya's on the fringe of the McDonnell Ranges, the mountains which stretch out to meet the desert to the west of Alice Springs. The arid zone, the desert country, covers almost half of the Australian continent. Some of the most sparsely populated country on earth. 50 years ago, nomadic Aboriginals lived off this land. It's sometimes hard to imagine that anyone could have lived out here at all. Typical Central Australian desert country. It was typified by all the spinifex here and the stunted mulgas and eucalypts and the acacias and the hakeas, the whole lot. But not all Australian desert is like this. Over towards the east in the Simpson, it's all sand dunes, and over in the west, you tend to get your gibber deserts over there. If you look around here now and you think that because there's patches of green all over the place, it's not doing too bad, but that's not the case. They had a bit of rain around these parts a couple of weeks ago and the vegetation has reacted to that. Deep down inside, the desert is hurting because it's dry and they haven't had a wet season here for some years. Without traditional skills, an outsider would be very lucky to survive out here for more than a few days. Aboriginals had to achieve a fine balance in this environment. Their numbers were carefully regulated by the availability of food and water. And in dry times like this, there's also fierce competition for the food that is available. you learn pretty quickly that the early bird catches the worm. Here's a really good example of what I'm talking about. This is one of the capara species, 
Uh, and you can see here the old fruit that the birds got out early this morning. Probably about daybreak while I was still in the swag. They're no good. There's plenty of green ones left around the place. But up here, if we're lucky, we might be able to get a, a ripe one. Yeah, there's one there. Here we go. You can tell he's a caparis because of the joint in the stem here. And also on this particular species, the ribs that run down the outside of the fruit. I guess if I'm going to get him, I'll have to get up earlier myself. I'll just bust him open and show you what he looks like. There we go. Not bad, the pulp's quite sweet. Seeds are a bit bitter though. I reckon if you left him a couple more days, he'd be right on the mark. But if I did that, the birds would get him. Can't afford to do that when you're trying to survive. Yeah, that's a little blue tongue lizard. In traditional times, fellows like this and guanas and lizards all through the desert country here were used pretty thoroughly for bush tucker. This little bloke, he's pretty harmless. He's just out having a bit of a sunbake. We just let him go. Here we go. In the desert, more than anywhere else, survival depends on finding water. You have to be aware of the signs and constantly on the move. It doesn't rain too often out here, so when you see it, that's where you head for, because the rain brings not only the water, but also food. And there are more permanent water indicators, the tribal road signs of the desert country. This is an engraving, it's not a painting. And what it depicts, it's the Aboriginal logo or sign for waterhole. Sometimes you get it with one circle or a number of circles, but it's very common right throughout the desert country. These sort of things you'll find popping up, particularly around waterholes. Looking around here, I'd guess that the water hole will have to be up there in that gorge somewhere. Somewhere over there where they've got those rock figs because that's also an indicator. There you go. That's the little rock fig. You always find him growing around rocky outcrops and escarpments, just like this. And quite often, he's near a waterhole. Near the waterhole down there, about 50 feet below me. If we could trace the root system down, we'd follow it going right down through the cracks and the crevices, eventually ending up on ground level down there, sucking up the water. These little fruit here are edible. The birds down there, those little finches flying around the water, eat them all the time. But they're pretty dry, and because of that fact, the birds require that water all the time throughout the day. Aboriginal people had a little trick for those finches. They'd break off a leaf like that, or a few of them, and because the, the figure's got a very white latex type sap, they'd spread it along the branch. And when the little Pinches came up and landed on the branch, they get stuck to it, couldn't fly away. So the Aboriginals were able to have a feed of finch as well. These things are so dry, I've got to get myself a drink quick, smart.
Water holes play a big part in the legends of the desert people. That's hardly surprising. They were once the key to survival in the desert. They dictated where people could live and how many people could be supported. Today, one of the largest Aboriginal communities out here is at a place called Yuen the Moo, home for many of the Walpuri people. The supply of water is no longer so critical. Water for these communities comes from bores sunk deep into the earth. But the tribal elders still attach a deep significance to the location of water holes in their surrounding country. And for me, it's a constant fascination to find out just how and where you can find water. This land belongs to Darby Jamba Jimba. He's one of the true characters of the desert country. Darby grew up on this land. He's part of it. And his knowledge is enviable. At a big hole here, and um, they get water from here. Out of this one here, digging down? Yeah, digging down. In these conditions, even the most reliable places can turn out dry. This one here. Right. There's probably water I'm deep down water. here, but there comes a point where it's no longer viable to continue. Uh, You'd be using up too much valuable energy. Might be too dry this one, I'll put Yeah, dry. <coughs> Probably dry here. Yeah. Probably dry here. Yeah. Nothing. Mother. Put it in the rock one. Put it in the rock one round here. Yeah, we've got it round here. Darby knows that there must be water out here somewhere. And he'll find it by observing the birds and the insects and following the animal tracks. Before I first came out into the desert country many years ago, I imagined that a water hole was a place that you had to swim in. Rock hole, this one here. Ah, yeah. All out the gully there. What I didn't realise then was just how precious even a tiny bit of water can be out here. And to find that, you really have to persevere. Dry again. Yeah. And this one dry too. Ah, yeah. Yeah. He might be a little bit wet down there. He might a little there. bit there. Coming down from down there, right? Yeah, come down there from that place. You reckon I might dig him out and we'll have a yeah, look? Yeah, you can have a take him off, eh? Huh? Right. And rocks, rocks. Dig him out down there. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit in there. Oh, a little bit there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Down here. Yeah. Been there? Yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit of water there. Yeah, a little bit. Mm. There's not much chance of us swimming here. Yes. It'll be all right. Yeah, it'll be all right. It'll be working all right. Yeah. There you go. I'll tell you what, it took a bit of finding because we started right over there in the hills, worked our way around here and finally found it here. Even though you can look in a little catchment area like this and it looks dry, sometimes if you dig down, you can get the water. This stuff down here is pretty dirty. And I wouldn't drink it the way it is there now. If I wanted to drink it, I'd have to filter it. And the way to do that is to get something like a shirt sleeve or a trouser leg, tie a knot in the bottom, fill it up with sand and a bit of charcoal, pour the dirty water in the top, and then collect it out the bottom when it's all been filtered. I don't have to drink this water but it's good to know how to find it. It's really only about 70 years okay. since Europeans first tried to settle in this part of the country. So Darby remembers the days when the Walpi people used to roam the Tanami Desert up to the north. 
the victory. Yeah. I could listen for hours to his stories about the past. What about the cave? Uh, that cave there, we camp, if we turn a big rain come through, and we camp there. What have you been talking about eating in that cave there? The kangaroo? Uh, kangaroo, yes. Emu? Mm, yeah. No. No? Not any kangaroo. Nothing? And guana. Guana? Guana. Mm. Where you get that guana? Uh, anywhere, it's here. In the same country? Yeah. All over that way? Yeah. Afternoon time, they're coming out. Come for a drink now? Yeah, oh, they're going to get in like the water. <laughs> <laughs> Heading back to the east from Derby's country, you strike some mountains known as Hart's Range. Behind this range, down to the south, are the sand hills of the Simpson Desert. Hart's Range provides a water catchment sufficient to support a small community and some exotic local bush tucker. This is the rather oddly named Bush Banana. More like a choco than a banana, it grows on a vine which scrambles over bushes and trees. We might have a look at a couple of them do. Yeah. A cooked you midday to... meal of this local delicacy provides a chance to catch up with some old contacts from the Hearts Range community. Yeah. 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 I might tell you that you can also eat these things raw. And before we do that, I'll just cut one open and show you something which is really amazing. A bit tough. Just cut him open like that, a casing. And look at this. Isn't that tremendous? What it is are the seed pods here attached to all this sort of fluff. With a wind like this around, when the, the whole fruit gets a bit old and a bit shriveled up, these things start to break away and get carried away with all the wind like that. But those seeds are edible, just like that. And they've got a taste of almost identical to peas, raw peas. They're beard stuff. When you get rid of all the, the seed pod stuff inside, and I'll just dig it out a minute here. There we go. Look at that. You can also eat the case lining. Just cut him out. There's more in there. Crikey. Full of it. Yeah. Eat that case lining as well. But like most vegetables, you can eat them either raw or cooked up. This is young one, this is young. It's not good to eat. Mm. Like this one. Yeah, just a little bit raw yet. A little bit raw yet? Yeah. Mm. Good. Mm. That's a cook one. That's a cook one? Yeah. When they go pop like that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey! Yeah. From Hart's Range, I'm pushing northwest. It's a couple of days' drive to La Germanu, and that'll take me right through the middle of the Tanami Desert, out to the west of Tennant Creek. The Tanami is a vast spinifex and mulga desert, which occupies the very heart of the Northern Territory. It's Aboriginal land, but these days, virtually no one lives out here. And that means you've really got to be on your guard because if you get into trouble, you could find yourself caught out here for weeks. It certainly pays to check out your vehicle and your equipment when you're driving around this sort of country. This old jerry can here. The seam's been busted apart. A bit of fatigue, I'd reckon. Can't really blame it. I've carted it halfway around Australia. I suppose I could fix it up by getting a, a hot screwdriver or something and putting it on that plastic and sealing it back over. But out here you don't have to do that because we can find out in the Spinifex country a natural cure. I'll just tilt him back so I don't lose all my water because water's pretty important around here. Yeah, that stopped me.
Got here is a bit of spinifex resin, and it's not really resin. The ants have gathered it together to make an ant's nest out of it. The resin seeps out of the stems and the flowerings of the spinifex grass out here. They put it together and build their nest up, and it ends up rock hard. You can melt this stuff down and use it like a glue or a putty or something like that. And when it dries out, it's very, very hard, as you can see there. I'll just leave that aside for a minute because I'm going to have to light a fire to get that melted down. I'll show you a little trick that you can use for lighting fires out in the bush, if you're lucky enough, without matches. You get a bit of Conti's crystals and sugar and mix them together 50-50. You can put him on a rock like that, spread him out a bit. And then using a bit of that cotton wool, you scrape a knife very hard over the top. And maybe if you're lucky, you can get the two crystals to crush up and react with each other and cause a spark to fly, which hopefully the, the cotton wool will pick up and ignite. There we go. So he goes. I'll just smash up some of this resin now. There we go. Put him into here. Put it on the fire. Let him melt down a bit. Should do. Good idea to have a fire going out in these parts, particularly if you get caught and you're lost. People can see them quite often from miles away. Another good thing to have is one of these things here. It's a signal mirror. They've got an Amy mark in them. They reflect the sunlight straight up into the sky. They're excellent. That should dry off nice and hard pretty quickly. But I reckon I know where I can get some water to top it up again too. Survival can often depend on a bit of ingenuity. And that can mean making the country work for you in unusual ways. This is the sort of thing I'm looking for. A eucalypt or gum tree. Give you a quick refresher on botany because what happens is that the gums and all the vegetation around here they suck up the moisture out of the soil pump it up through capillary action through the trunk and then the branches and then disperse it off into the atmosphere now if you can capture that moisture before it goes into the atmosphere you've got yourself water looking around here you wouldn't reckon that there was any moisture at all in the soil but the tree doing its work and the fact that it's here alive and well tells us there's got to be some there somewhere. So what I'm going to do is put this great big plastic bag over this branch here. Once you've sealed the bag over the branch, it doesn't take long in these hot conditions for the process to start up. From here on, the bag and the sun do all the work for you. All you need to do is get out of the heat and save your energy. With a bit of patience and a few hours wait, you'll soon have some water. It may not seem like much, 
that could be enough to save your life. Try this out and see if it works. Yep, good as new. of La Germanu was on the northern fringes of the Tanami Desert. And what better way to finish off a desert journey than with a bush tucker trip? In Aboriginal society, it's the women who do the great majority of the food gathering. The men are the hunters. So it's the women that I'm indebted to for most of my knowledge about bush tucker. Today, we're digging for that gourmet food of the desert, the witchetty grub. You find them in the root system of the Acacia Kempiana, or witchetty bush, as it's usually called. These women are descendants of the nomadic people who once populated the desert. And they still value these traditional foods more than anything else they eat today. This one? No. That one? Yeah. Oh, right, there we go. Hey, look at that. Good one, eh? Good one. When you're talking about bush tucker in Australia, you really can't go without the witchetty grub because this fella, he's a real classic. Eventually, these grubs grow up and turn into a moth. They burrow themselves out of the ground and fly away. So the trick is to dig them up before they get to that stage. There are two ways that you can eat them. Cook them up on the hot coals and eat them cooked, or you can eat them raw. Tell you something, a few years ago, an old fella way down the south of here told me that there were still a couple of small Aboriginal groups walking around the desert country. And with bush tucker like this, I reckon I can't blame them. Uh. Eaten raw, the witchetty grubs are very rich. Sometimes. Rubber raw, eh? Yeah, the raw one. And when they're cooked, they taste a bit like scrambled eggs. That means you eat Wuka. For the women of La Germanu, a bush tucker trip is a continuing ritual which links them to their country and to their past. <laughs> And for me, well, it's just great to be part of it. You want a party? <laughs> Only him, your top spins the beer. Yeah, he put away. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 